for me, reminisce some time. The night they took my friend, try to black it out, but it plays again. When it's real, feelings hard to conceal. Can't imagine all the pain I feel. Give anything to hear half your breath. I know you're still living your life after death.
On behalf of Michelle and the entire family, I would like to share on their behalf their gratitude for you being here today and demonstrating your love, your care, your compassion, not only for Gregory, but for the whole family. They feel it, they see it, and it is encouraging to them. My name is Matt White, and I have the privilege to be Michelle and Natalie's pastor. I did not have the honor to ever get to know Gregory as you have, but I've heard stories over these last few days, and you being here today further demonstrates what I've heard, that he was a kind man, a loving man, a fun man, a man that impacted many lives. You're here today as proof of that. I'm also here to encourage you. This is a sad day. This is a day that none of us would ever choose. This is a day that none of us would ever want to be here. Your pain is real. Your sadness is undeniable. But as we go through this service, I want you to think about this reality. That death is not natural. That's why you hate it. That's why you're feeling the way you feel. Our world wants to teach us that this is normal. This is not normal. This is not God's design. This is the result of all of us as sinners. And we're going to talk about that. But I want you to know we're here to help you and encourage you through this difficult day so that you can mourn but you can mourn as those who have hope. And we'll talk about that. I'd like to read a passage of Scripture that gives us the source of that hope. It's in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. You hear the Word of God, Christ Himself, the Lord and Savior, speaking on a night, the dreadful night, the night before he was crucified on behalf of sinners, the night that his faithful friends, his followers, were most distraught, discouraged, much like you are here today. And this is what he told them. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let me pray. Father God, we come before you on this day saddened, distraught, discouraged, and in many ways for many here today in despair. So we come and we cast our cares upon you as you have commanded us. We come to you because, Father, there's no one else to go to, no one else who can help, no one else who can heal, no one else who can encourage amidst difficult, tragic, horrific days like this. And so we come to you, our great Creator, the only and almighty God of all that is. We come to you as the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. We come to you as the one who has given us all life and breath. We come to you as the great judge of who we must all stand before. And we come to you as the great healer of the soul. And so, Father, we ask that you would do your work among us, that you would give hope in the midst of this sadness, life in the midst of this death, that you, Father, would do what only you can do and open blind eyes to see the only hope that is Christ. Father, I pray that you would comfort Michelle and the whole family and all the friends and all the loved ones who are hurting now. Comfort them with a comfort that lasts 
a comfort that is real, a comfort that cannot be taken from them, a comfort that is not circumstantial, a comfort that is not driven by feelings, but driven by the facts of the Lord Jesus Christ and His death, His resurrection, and His eternal promise of hope. Oh, Lord God, we come to You because You are the only one that can fix what is broken. And so we ask, Father, that You would do this, that we may rightfully heal in true faith and obedience to You. So bless us in this difficult time. Help us to grieve in a way that points us to Christ and help us to honor You above all else in all that is said and done. For life is not about us. It's actually all about You. So help us to understand that even better in the midst of this bitterness of today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Melvin, yep. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My condolences to the family and all those from the 13th Street Church of Christ where Gregory's brother Jawan worships with us. We just want to let you all know that we are here for you all because he's our brother in Christ. Anything that's going through with him, we're going through as well. We stand with him. We stand with you all. And I just pray you'll never get over the tragedy that occurred. But my prayer is that the pain that is associated with the tragedy may subside just a little bit every day. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power through how the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my say your God to thee how great thou art how great thou art when through the world and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when I look down from lofty mountains grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great 
thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall With shouts of acclamation and take, take me home. What joy, what joy will fill my heart there now so and there in adoration, there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou How are everybody doing? Uh, just going for everybody who didn't know my brother, I'm going to uh, talk to y'all so y'all can, you know what I'm saying? I know everybody know. I want to thank everybody also for coming out. This is love. Shows how much Greg affected people, how much everybody loved them. And let me go ahead. I'm going to try to get through this, y'all. Uh, as I know, some people know my brother is Gregory. Some people know him as Wayne. So Gregory Wayne Lewis, the son of Wayne Anthony Beasley and Michelle Denise Lewis. Gregory was born February 7, 1992 in Chevrolet, Maryland. He was called home March 9, 2024. Gregory went to Arundel High School. He was an amazing athlete, as everybody knows who grew up with us. He was a beast in Little League, like literally. 
He uh, played for the Lowell Wildcats, Columbia Ravens. Uh, he learned to play basketball, baseball. We played like every sport in the neighborhood. We would play football uh, in the streets. <laughs> but that's what, how we did. We just, every day we was outside trying to get in something. But football was like his main passion and he was, he was good at it. He loved it. I'm gonna be a little bit, but then I'm gonna uh, say from the heart. Uh, he loved the outdoors, you know. He he liked to fish, liked to be outside doing something. He was a good cook. I don't know if everybody probably had his cooking. That's one thing he can do. He can cook. He can put something together from scratch. No matter, he made it happen. Uh, he was, he, you know, he worked. He started working around. He started working young. He was a cook at Ruby Tuesdays, and then he worked his way. He started working at Chevy's, serving, and then he became a bartender. And then he was a bartender at Willie K's and continued on at Lambert's, where he basically did everything. He cooked, he, he cleaned, he uh, bartended, served, whatever he, you needed him to do, he was doing it. He even cooked crabs. Y'all had some crabs at Lambert's, he probably didn't want to cook them. So, yeah, like, he was just a hard work. My brother was a hard work. That's one thing I can say. Like, he loved, he loved to, like, have fun and party, but he always, when he was at work, he did what he, he worked hard. You could depend on him. He was a very dependable person. My brother, uh, that's where he met everybody, as a lot of you know him from, either Willie K's, Lambert's, or we grew up together. He impacted everybody's lives. And... I see all the love, I do. Gregory was preceded in death by his, by, by his daughter, Winter Lewis, his father, Wayne Beasley, and his brother, Trayvon Tubbs. His maternal, his uh, grandmother, Missy Lewis, his grandmother, Sorry, y'all. Right. Right. O.B. Beasley, if I said that right, I'm sorry. I'm gonna make sure I said that right. Uh, it's Aunt Sherry, Rolf, and his cousin Jeremy, Gilliam, who we love very much. We miss him too. Uh, Greg got great memories to be cherished by. He got his, by his only son, Mason, McCoffley, his daughter Avery Johnson, Autumn Lewis, and Chasson Lewis. My mother loved him and adored him so much. Uh, my mother, Michelle Lewis, his stuff out, my stuff out of James House, uh, his siblings, me, Anthony Lewis, Jawan House, James House, his siblings on his dad's side, who we love also very much. We all like one big happy family, y'all. Uh, let me Tony Beasley, Brittany Beasley, Tara Tubbs, Marquise Beasley, Destiny Beasley, Dominique Washington, and Imani Beasley. His, he has godmother, with aunt also, my aunt Nally Burgess, uh, my aunt Tanya Gilliam, my aunt Tina, Paolo, and my uncle Dan, Paolo, my uncle Ed. Burgers, uh, cousins, uh, cousins. We, he also cousins. Cachino Lewis, Natia Davis, Travis Davis, Johnny Sellers, Edward Burgers III, and Sierra Gilliam. Uh, Greg was liked by and loved by many people who adored him. He was out very. He had a very outgoing and fun personality. He was very helpful and kind to all. Like I said. Uh, to best describe my brother, y'all know him, Goofy. He got on half of y'all nerves, I know he did. <laughs> Trust me, he got my nerves every day. Uh, but we, that was my, like, right hand, man. We was in separate since we was born. <laughs> he called me all the time. 
I miss his phone calls. Cause I, he always, like, I'm probably the first person he calls, especially when he got into something. He calling me, I would tell him all the time, just wait till I get home, I'll figure it out. Or I like, just try to, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what you do now? Let me just get home and figure out. But I love him so much, man. As I know, Greg was, uh, uh, he'd do anything for anyone. He'd get his shirt off his back. He'd give you his last. And, I mean, we know he loved to have fun. If you, you, you have fun and party with him, you had a good time. I'll tell you that. It just could make everybody smile, feel the room with just laughter and just laughter and joy. But yeah, that was my brother, man. I'm gonna miss him so much. I'm gonna miss him. I'm gonna miss him. He called me at night all the time. I used to get so mad because I be sleep at three, four in the morning. I'm, but I'm gonna miss them calls. I am so much. I miss him already. I'm going to read a, a scripture out of the Bible. Lamentations, Le Lamentations 3, 22, 26. The st steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are the new every morning. Great thy faithfulness. faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. I found that place at the closer day. If my partner has left a void, then fill it with memories of joy. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss, all these things I too would miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish the sunshine for tomorrow. My life been full. I save it much. Good friends, good times. I love one's touch. Perhaps my time seem all too brief. Don't lifting it now, lifting it now with undue grief. Lift your heart and share it with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. I'm gonna read one more scripture, y'all. It's uh Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. Does anybody want to come? Say anything, Ma? Up in this room. Um, I get my phone to work right away. The letter to my way. Dear sweetheart, I never thought I would have to put these words down. Uh, I know that we all have to leave this world one day, but nevertheless, I always thought that God would call me home first, not the other way around. I want to thank God for you, Greg, my Wayne. I want to thank God for allowing me to have the pleasure of having you as a son.
pleasure of your smile, your genuine loving spirit, your great heart throughout your life. I'm sorry that this world just seems so big and unmanageable at times. At times for you, I'm sorry that your sorrow for your loved ones was such a giant. I know that you tried against all odds, and I know that by the grace of God, I'm going to see you again, sweetheart. My heart knows that you are present with your Savior, praising him for even this day. Free from pain and suffering, free from this uncertain world. I'm going to love on your children and keep you alive in them. You can now rest well, baby. Your fight is over. Mom loves you forever and evermore. You used to say, come on, Mom, let's make moves. <laughs> that was our thing. But you move without me this time. So I'm going to hold to the memories and find peace knowing you are with the Lord. I love you, son, until we meet again. Amen. Um, Gregory, one of Gregory's youngest brothers. Uh, my brother, my brother. Whenever I wasn't with my younger brother when we were young, I would sneak around the neighborhood and see what you were up to. Even as I got older, you always check on me and, and want to know what I'm up to. I'm going to miss not seeing you around the house every day. <laughs> Check it every morning just to see if you came home. You making us, you, you hyping us up and making us all laugh and smile. I pray that one day I'll see you again. I love you forever, bro. Man, look, Greg, I can say it's two words. Start it. You feel me? That was G Money, man. And G Money was my brother. And I loved him. That was, he was my heart. Like, y'all might not know me. My name is Troy. But, man, Greg saved me back in 2012. I know him since 2012, football season. You feel me? September 19th. You hear me? That was my brother. I loved him. We fought together. We bled together. You feel me? Like, man, I'm going to miss him. And I'm gonna I ain't going to say too much. Keep y'all time. But, like, one time, me and Greg, you know, Greg get drunk, man. And Greg, no, but listen, but you know, Greg used to get the crying. You know, Greg get, get the crying. And I'm like, man, get up off me, man. Try to hit that. He's like, nah, real T Roy, look, let me tell you something. We drunk, we both fell out in the field. We looking up at the stars. I'm telling you, no, for real, true story. He said, bro, do you think, he said, bro, what do you think come after this? I was like, I don't know, it's, right now it's tonight, so I guess the morning, nigga. And he was like, no, no, no. He tapped me, T-Roy, no, he tapped me on my chest. We laid right next to each other. Nah, bro, do you think there's something come after, after death? I said, gee, money, I don't know. I was like, I thought we just two niggas that live in the moment. He's like, you right, you right T-Roy. I said, because, you know, I don't let me get to crying. He said, yo, T-Roy. He said, you think we can still be tight when we 60? I said, yeah, man, for, man, we bros for life. He's like, everlasting to the casket, and after that, I said, bro, and after that, bro, I miss him, man. Oh, man, hey, he's my heart. That shit, my heart broke right now. I, I'm sorry, Lou, I said the F word. But, <laughs> but it, it, it come, you know, it come from a good place. You know what I mean, like, that's G Money, man. Man, he man. Anybody had something to do with him or had a problem with him? Man, come see me, man. And he knew. He called me, bro. And Aunt no, I ain't lying. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Huh? Oh what? Come on. Oh man, I love that man. Everyone uh, keep saying that. Uh, I love G Money. Uh, you already know that. Uh, how y'all doing? I'm uh, I'm Greg's youngest brother. 
uh, James. Um, I just wanted to say a few words about my brother. Hello, everyone. I'm Greg's stepmom. And thank you, Michelle, for letting me be a part of his life. I'm forever grateful for you. Greg was a wonderful person. He helped me in my darkest times. He helped care for my dad when my dad had cancer. His heart is so pure. And anybody in this room, I know he's helped everybody in some way. Thank you for all the love. And thank you for helping his family. Thank you. I'm Greg's sister. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get through this. Oh. I have a lot of siblings, but this was the one that I was the closest to. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. With all due respect, thank you for um, your time and attention. I am one of um, Gregory's um, daughter's grandmother, and I couldn't sit there, couldn't sit there because I remember how much he wanted um, his children to know each other. And I want to say that um, on behalf of Avery, and his other children, Michelle and I are gonna make sure that happened. We're gonna make sure his memory lasts. We're going to make sure. I'm, I'm with you, Michelle, on that. I promise you that, that we will, as well as my family. My father is Pastor Freddie Davis, who's the pastor of Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and we will make sure this happens. Thank you, Jay. Come and sing a, a song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on and let me stand high. I'm tired. I am weak. I am Oh, take 
Thank you, Christy. A lot has been said both here this morning and obviously in your homes and around. I think it's helpful, though, in these moments that stand before us to hear from the wisest man who ever lived. I think it's helpful in times of hurt when confusion sets in to bring clarity to our heart and mind. And the only place that clarity can come in times of confusion like this is from the Word of God. Solomon was said to be the wisest man who ever lived in that time. Solomon penned the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, there is a passage, a verse that is shocking. It is profound. If you hear it correctly, in these moments right now, it very likely will knock you off your seat. This is the Word of God. This is the truth. Hear what Ecclesiastes 7.2 says. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to the house of of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living lay it to heart. What does that mean? Sounds quite perplexing. If I may paraphrase, it is better to go to a funeral than to go to a wedding. Why is it better for you to be here in this moment on this day. Remember what I said in the beginning, none of us would choose to be here. None of us want to be here. None of us would ever pick to be here, especially in the way we are here, in mourning the loss of your dear son, your brother, your loved one, your friend. But we are here. This is where we find ourselves. Why? Would the holy word of God, perfect in all its way, without error, say to us from the wisest man who ever lived, inspired by God Almighty, say, it is actually better for you to be here today than it would be to be at a party somewhere or like a wedding. Why would it say that? Why would God Almighty say that? Well, let me give you three reasons. Three reasons to answer this question. Three reasons that you must cling to. Listen to me, dear loved ones. You don't know me from Adam. You'll probably never talk to me. You'll probably never see me again. But I am here without any question by the appointment of God to bring you the truth so that your hurting heart can be comforted in the only way that it will ever be comforted that will last. So what stands before us in the next few minutes, listen to me, it's not about Greg. What stands before us is all about you. Everything that's come before has been about Greg, to honor him and to give praise for all that he is and all that he's done on behalf of you in blessing you, encouraging you, and you've given testimony to that. But what happens now is not about him. It's about us who remain. It's about you. It's about what you're going to do with the truth you're being confronted with even now as you mourn his death. Three reasons why it's better for you to be here today than it is to be at a party. Number one, because today, today you are faced with the brevity of life. Today you are forced to ponder. You are forced to think through how short life is. Sadly, for most of us, whether you'll admit it or not, you know it in your heart, 
We live as if life is going to go on forever, don't we? We live whimsically, very thoughtlessly. We don't consider the end. But when we come to a funeral, don't we? We stop and we pause and we reflect because all of us know in our hearts that where you see Greg now, that's going to be you. That's going to be me. That's going to be all of us sooner or later. We have no idea when, but we do know, lest Christ returns first, we will all face that reality. Life is short. For some of you, it may be today. It may be tomorrow. And it's only at a funeral, isn't it, that the veil is lifted and the facade of the fake world of which most of us live in and live through is taken away. And at a funeral, we are faced with reality. It's, it's, it's rare in our fake world to see reality, isn't it? Fake news, fake people, fake everything. But at a funeral, it's not fake. At a funeral, it's real, and it stares us in the face, and it shocks us back to reality. This is one of the reasons why the wisest man that ever lived said, it's better to go to a house in mourning, because it's there that truth stares you in the face. And notice what he says, the living take it to heart. Again, it's, a, it's about the living. It's about us. What are you going to do with these moments? You're going to sugarcoat it and just sweep it away and act like it's no big deal? No, we can't do that. Our life is but a vapor. Our life is only here for a short time. Very short. And the funeral helps remind us of this. That it's but a breath. The wisest man that ever lived said that, but so did Moses, in Psalm 90, verse 12, he says, teach us to number our days, here you go, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. As you begin to ponder the brevity of life and think through this reality, that's the first step of becoming wise. It's so helpful, so needed. Not only is being at a funeral better than being at a party because you're actually forced to ponder the brevity of life, but also, here you go, dear loved ones, it's hard to hear, but we need to hear it. You're also forced to ponder the reality of death, the reality of death. You see, it's not simply contemplating that life is short, but that death is imminent. It's close, it's coming, it's at hand. It will quickly be on all of us. Funerals like this one, it stares us in the face. Just as Greg is now, so we will be. And the Bible guarantees it. And life proves it. For all of mankind's history, he's been trying to stop it. And it's never happened. And it never will. It's one of the few guarantees in this world. Unless Christ returns first, you will die. I guarantee it. I will die. My children, my wife, my family, just like yours, will die. Why? Why is it that way? I don't care if you're Chinese, Japanese. I don't care what ethnicity you come from. I don't care what continent you're from. I've traveled the globe, and everywhere I go, there are certain things that are common to all men, and one of them is we all die. There has to be an answer for that. Oh, there is. The Bible says the answer is very clear. We all die because we've all sinned. All of us are sinners. The Bible's clear about that. Romans chapter, 12, chapter 5 verse 12 says it so clearly. And it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the beginning. And it speaks this way. And I quote, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam. And so death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death is the result of Adam's sin as God promised in Genesis 2.17. For as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.21, as in Adam all die. Why is that? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's why you die. That's why I will die. Because we're all sinners. We all rebel against God. We've all been born rebelling against God and we all live as rebels against God. That's what the Bible calls sin. And you know it. I know it. We all know it. 
We try to pretend like we're not, but it's the truth, and our hearts do not deceive us in that. We try to cover it up. And the Bible is clear. In Ezekiel 8.20, the soul that sins, it will die. But here's, here's the reality. To the gentleman who spoke earlier, I'll answer his question, and I'll answer it here and now for all of you to hear. I will tell you what happens after death. This is what's so sobering about death. Death isn't the issue, dear loved ones. It's what happens after death that is the issue. Do not pretend, do not pretend on this day or any day that you do not know what happens after death because the Bible, which never lies, straight from God Himself, tells us that death is not the end. It's actually, in many ways, just the beginning. And it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for all men to die once, and then after that comes judgment. That's the issue that we are faced with. When you die, you will stand before Almighty God, and you will have to give an account for your life. And dear loved ones, that, that is the most sobering reality in life. So don't go through life sugarcoating it and pretending like it's not coming. Oh, it's coming after all of us. And death is not the issue that you need to be concerned about most. Judgment, God's judgment is coming for all of us because again, we've all sinned and therefore we must prepare ourselves for this. Listen to Revelation chapter 20. This comes up all the time in the Bible. It, we don't have to wonder about what happens after death. The Bible is clear. Listen to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Listen to how clear this is. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire." Unquote. We don't have to wonder. We have to respond. We don't have to be perplexed. We have to be broken. Broken of our sin. Broken of ourself. You see, a funeral like this, in so many ways, is the most blessed place to be for us who are still living because it is here that the false veneer of life is pulled away. That means it is here that once again we are graciously reminded by Almighty God that this life is really all about preparation for the future judgment to come. For life is short, death is real, but judgment is for eternity. Judgment from Holy God against our sin will last as Revelation 20 verse 10 and Revelation 14 11 says it will last forever and ever. Are you ready to face that judgment? Are you ready to face God in judgment? Acts 17 verse 31 says the future judgment is so sure. Listen, who here is going to deny the resurrection of Christ? He's the only one whose tomb is empty. And Acts 17 says that the judgment coming is so sure that God himself proved it by raising Christ from the dead. Listen, the reason why the stone was rolled away from the tomb of Christ was not to let Jesus out. He doesn't need anybody to let him out. It was to let all of us in to show that he's not here. And therefore, that judgment's coming and Christ proved it by raising the judge from the dead. And he's like, get ready. Acts chapter 17 says it so clearly. He calls everyone to repent and believe in preparation for the judgment that is to come. Romans chapter 2 says in verse 5 that if you don't, you're actually storing up judgment. Storing up judgment for that day of judgment. But there's another reason, and I'm glad you're still here, because there's another reason. Listen to me. Yes, funerals remind us of the brevity of life. Funerals remind us of the reality of death. But dear loved ones, do not miss it. A funeral like this in every way 
It reminds us, or better yet, it comforts us. It comforts. You're like, really? Yes, listen to me. It comforts us with the opportunity of hope. There stands before you an opportunity of hope today. Real hope. Lasting hope. Satisfying hope. It is here today, and it is offered to you. Now listen, hope that I'm talking about, true hope, is the sure and steady anchor of the soul. I'm not talking about the false and fleeting hope that the world offers, that you all know too well about it, right? We understand this false hope. The world's hope always fades. It's always fleeting. It's always frustrating because it's always fake. It does not satisfy the longing of the soul. It never lasts. It never does. The world offers a hope that will never satisfy your soul. And you know that all too well. That's why you continue to pursue, right? You go after this, after this drug, after this girl, after this party, after whatever. Pursuing some sense of satisfaction, purpose, hope. And it does not work. It leaves you hopeless in the end. The world's hope is a temporary, circumstantial satisfaction that's like a mist. You see it, you feel it, and it's gone. And you wonder, what happened? i got to go after it again. It's like a soap bubble with my children. And I, I blow the soap bubbles and you go after them and you poke them and it's gone. That's the, that's the hope the world offers you. But that is not the hope that Christ offers you. He offers you a hope that is eternal. It is an eternal confidence and assurance that never spoils, it never fades, it never disappoints, and it always fully satisfies because it comes from and it's focused on Him. He is the living hope. That's what Peter calls Him. It is hope that is rested and focused on Him. He is our hope. See, the world offers us a offers us a hope that is a possibility, a probability, a potentiality that never comes to be. But the Bible offers us not a hope so. I hope this preacher will get done soon. That's the world's use of hope, isn't it? But that's not how the Bible uses hope. The Bible speaks of this term hope over and over again. It's a no-so it's a confident assurance of what you can rest upon. You can anchor your soul in it, and it will never let you down, never let you go, and never let you up. Let me explain. The only hope that lasts in judgment, the judgment we just talked about, the only hope that stands up in death, the only hope that helps in judgment is the living hope given in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is the perfect Son of God. He came to earth. He lived the perfect life and died the sacrificial death. And He rose the victoriously. He rose victoriously from the grave in the place of sinners. This means Jesus, the eternal Son of God, lived the life you cannot live. You want to go to heaven? Listen to what Jesus says. You must be perfect. Good luck with that. Who here is going to say, I'm good? You know that's not true. But that's Jesus' own words. Go back and read them in Matthew chapter 5. You want to go to heaven? You, you must be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. What was his point? It's not going to happen. No one's perfect. No one will ever be perfect except Jesus. That's why he came and lived the perfect life. That's the whole point. That's why he's our hope. We trust in his life. So He comes and, and He lives the perfect life. That's what God's law demands. But it also, Jesus pays the penalty because we've all broken it. So He not only lives the perfect life, but He dies the perfect death. The death that satisfies Almighty God. Remember, every soul that sins must die. And Jesus says, I'll die for them. I'll die for them so that they don't have to die in judgment. This is the hope. Because dear loved ones, your greatest enemy is not your finances. It's not your emotions. 
It's not critical race theory or whatever our world might tell you is somehow your greatest enemy. It's not. Your greatest enemy is your own sin and the judgment that's coming. All those other things could go away and you will still go to hell. But it's only in Christ. It's only Him and it's only His life, His death and His resurrection that will save you from the wrath of God that's coming. This is why this is such a blessed place to be. Because it's here that if a preacher will be faithful, and there's not very many faithful preachers today, I'll tell you that. Because they'll get up and they'll make you feel good while you're going to hell. But I can't do that because I love you too much. I'm going to tell you the truth. And yeah, it hurts. But it's what we need to hear Because that truth will hurt and heal at the same time if, if you will repent and believe. This is the call of the gospel. The call of the gospel, listen to me, do not miss it. The call of the gospel is not add Jesus to your life. Because that's what most churches preach today and that's what most preachers preach. They say you got a bad life, you need some Jesus. Kind of like steak seasoning sauce. You got a bad steak, just add a little salt to it, it'll make it better. That's what Jesus is for most people. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the gospel. The gospel is you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ. You must completely turn your back on yourself and say, I'm done living for me. I'm done living for my dreams, this world's hope. I'm finished with it because it's a joke. And now I recognize I've rebelled against Almighty God and I'm turning to Christ, the only one. And I'm going to take up my cross of humiliation. I'm going to take up my cross of death and I'm going to die to Him every day. I'm going to live for Him every day. And yes, I'm going to sin. Yes, I'm going to be imperfect. But my direction is Christ, no longer self. That's the call of the Gospel. That's why Jesus Himself said, unless a man renounce everything to follow Me, he cannot be My disciple. Jesus said, you can't just add me to your life like a U-Haul trailer to the back of a pickup truck. That'll send you to hell just as fast as being a pagan who worships some other false god. And yet that's what we have in America. So we come to a funeral like this, you have the opportunity to have living hope, real hope, not a false hope, but a true hope that will last because the death of Christ, the life of Christ, the resurrection of Christ is our only hope. And that way, your hope is fixed on Him. Listen, I do a lot of funerals. And sadly, I do a lot of funerals for people who take their own life. And Michelle has told me that some of you have actually told her that you've thought of doing that. Listen to me. With all that I have within me, as I stand before you, maybe never getting to speak to you again, with all that is within me, I beg of you, do not do that. That is not the way. Do this. See yourself as a sinner who has rebelled against Almighty God. Open up the Word of God. Give your life to Christ. Turn away from yourself and beg of God to forgive you. And He will. And He will give you purpose and meaning. He will give you healing and hope. Come talk to me. Come talk to anybody in our church or anybody who will teach you the truth of the gospel. And they will tell you this. The way is not by taking your own life. The way is giving your life to Christ. That is what we need, all of us. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, we have the same issue. We're all sinners. But we have the same Savior. It's Christ, and only Christ. Remember what I read at the beginning. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. It's just Him. It's not through a church. It's not through a system. It's not through Judaism, Roman Catholicism, Buddhism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam. I don't care what ism you want to attack to it. Jesus is the one that said, He and He alone is the only way. This is your hope. This is the hope you can have, not just today, but forevermore. I offer it to you today just as Jesus did and calls me to do. And I beg of you to repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Christ. For that is where God Almighty can take death and bring eternal life out of it. That's what it's about.
Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing of it. We pray that you would comfort souls with the comfort that comes from Christ. Help us now, Lord, to respond to your word in a way that honors you. Bless us now, Lord, with the blessing of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think Christy's going to come and sing again for us and help us think on these things. As the pastor said, Jesus Christ is the way. And whatever you're going through, he is there for you because our God is a way maker. Our God is a promise keeper. He's our light in the darkness, and we know that that is who he is. So those are the words I want to encourage you with right now, that even in this time, as you don't understand, and you have so many questions, and you want to know why, but no answers are coming, and you feel like you're alone, and you feel like you can't handle it, I want you to know that he is right there. There's an old uh, poem called Footprints. This is the time when God is carrying you. Right now, when you feel like you can't do anything and you're too weak, it's because he's carrying you and giving you the strength that you need to make it through this and to be a witness as you've already been to help someone else, to change someone else's life. Remember that. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you, for you are my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending broken hearts. I worship you. I worship you. For you are my way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light
light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Hey, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. God, no. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. No, you're my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are my way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 For you are my way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, you are my way maker. Miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Thank you. Let's think about that for a moment. Isn't that what we've already heard? The way maker? Jesus said, I am the way. He made the way. No one goes to heaven unless they follow the way of Christ. There's all kinds of ways, so man says. But Jesus said there's one way. It's the way that he made. Yeah, he's the way maker, for sure. He's the only way maker. Man makes his own way, but Christ says, no, my way is the only way. Yeah, he's the miracle worker, for sure. Greatest miracle of, of all time was that God eternal became man. Yeah, he's the miracle worker. He took on flesh, the second member of the Godhead, and he's the promise keeper. He promises that everyone who will turn to Him in repentant faith. Everyone who repents of their sins and trusts in Christ, He will forgive. And He also promises that all who do not, He will judge. Yeah, He's the promise keeper. Question is, what promise will you embrace? Forgiveness or judgment? Because He's promised to come back. He'll come back to save Bring to him all those who believe, and he'll come back to judge all those who do not. Absolutely. Understand the truth of what you've just heard sung as the Bible explains it. Then, and only then, can you have peace if you embrace it. 
we've got to prepare for the internment instructions and address are on the back of your program. And so I'm going to pray and then I'm going to dismiss us. I'm going to ask that we move out, outside so that the funeral home can take care of Gregory and prepare him for getting in the hearse and headed towards the internment. And so if you would, as I finish praying, I'll dismiss us and then we'll just move out quickly and move out with the family so that they could, so we can all get in our cars, those of us who are going and Michelle and the family, we can get in there and get over to the internment. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for the blessing of this life that you have given. Thank you that we could be here today to celebrate all that you've done in this life, but more importantly, all that you'll do in eternal life for all who believe. Help us to think these things through humbly, soberly, and rightfully that we might stand before you with peace, not under judgment, but under grace. Help us, Father, to think clearly about these things despite the confusion of these things on this day. Bless us now as we go. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed.